afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is our pleasure to welcome you in the auditorium of Modem today. Um, we've been giving you some handouts that have some quotes from the talk for today to, for you to follow more and to, um, yeah, at the end have some questions and uh, be a bit aware about what we have been, we will talk about. Um, my name is Patricia Couvé. I'm uh, one of the member of the collective Beyond the Post-Soviet. Uh, with my colleagues here, Julia um, Fish, Sasha Pevac, Christine Schaff, Viola, um, that I can see on the screen, but more are also online. We are very happy to welcome Ep Anus. Um, and first of all, uh, on the behalf of the collective, I would like to thank the uh, thanks the team of Mudam Luxembourg and personally Bettina Steinbrugge, Michel Cotton, Joël Valabrega. Clementine Probich and uh, Lina Jan, with whom I'm sharing the floor for this introduction, and um, for, their for their invitation and support in developing these programs, uh, which is entitled Colonialism in Camouflage in the frame of the Radio Disaster Series. So we are here today for the opening lecture of the series, uh, Colonialism in Camouflage and the Subalterns, who speaks Politics and the Resistance under Russian Rule by Dr. Ep Anus. Jerry Ip, uh, Ep, we are very happy to uh, and delighted that you accept our invitation to take part in this series. And dear colleague of the groups who join online, uh, we are happy to, to see you here. A uh, few words about Beyond the Post-Soviets. We are a collective that emerged in 2021 as a non-hierarchical collective, bringing together uh, people from these different backgrounds, uh, individual territory, and also perspective. We are artists, curators, researchers, thinkers, writers, but also witnesses. We gather around uh, a number of shared ideas, values, stories, emotions, or questions. Uh, let me mention some of them. How do we relate to these cultural and geographical regions that are central um, Eastern, that are in central, central Eastern Europe, the Baltic States, the Caucasus, and Central Asia? How are they perceived uh, outside and by whom are they represented? Are such terms as post-Soviet and post-Soviet space still valid? How do we produce knowledge collectively and effectively? And where is it situated in relation to post-colonial studies and decolonial approach? Uh, in line with these questions, our collective spread around the geographical Europe, uh, reading sessions, our plantage and screening, um, where we share individual stories, memories, and emotions. And um, with every sessions that we uh, that we hold, um, we engage with the local context and support locally grounded knowledge production. And these sessions are moments of global unlearning, the idea rooted in global imperialism. I'm just handing the mic to Lynn uh, to give you an introduction and then to our member of the collective for the lecture. Uh, thank you, Patricia, and thank you, Yulia, Sasha, and all the members of Beyond the Post-Soviet, and welcome to everybody joining us here in real life and on Zoom. Um, just a reminder for people with us on Zoom that this event is being recorded. Um, please do um, uh, turn off your cameras and your mics to ensure a smooth flowing of the event. Um, I'm just gonna introduce quickly what the Radio Disaster Series is. Um, so this is a public program that was launched last year and the first edition tackled the ecological crisis. Uh, for the second edition titled The Radio Disaster Series, Colonialism and Camouflage. Um, here in Mudam, uh, myself, my colleagues, Joël Valabrega, Clementine Proby, we were very happy to work uh, with Beyond the Post-Soviet. Um, the second edition will be devoted to decolonial thinking and how it can be used to critically reflect on and resist the, in the insidious of imperialist and colonialist uh, rhetoric and practices across Europe and in um, post-colonial territories. So today we're launching the first chapter, uh, which focuses on post-Soviet territories, uh, or what was been, what had been referred to previously as post-Soviet territories, as uh, Patricia mentioned. Um, and I think it's important also to remind everybody that uh, Mudam's invitation to be on the post-Soviet emerged in response to the military offense, uh, offensive that uh, Russia shunned on Ukraine earlier this year in February. Um, and Mudam thought it was uh, an important and urgent issue to tackle. 
Um, so this is the launch of the first chapter, but do stay tuned for the second chapter, which will unfold uh, over the first half of uh, 2023, and that will expand on the issues we'll talk about today, uh, while also focusing on the long lasting uh, consequences of Western European colonialism. So now I'll leave the, the floor to beyond the post-Soviet and Dr. Ep Anas. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Patricia. Hello, everyone. I'm Yulia Fisch, uh, part of uh, the collective Beyond the Post-Soviet. And yes, uh, indeed, the program Colonialism in, in Camouflage is one of the results of our long-term research uh, that we conducted uh, together collectively. And it reflects on the form of imperial violence and occupation in Central uh, Eastern Europe, in the Baltic states, the Caucasus and Central Asia. Today, the military aggression of Russia, what uh, Lin already mentioned against Ukraine, is a symptomatic result of ongoing imperial colonial strategies and mindset that have been pervading the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, and the Russian Federation for centuries. And with this series of events that uh, start today and will unfold in Mudam, we invite audiences in Luxembourg and communities to take a closer look um, at the broader issues of colonialism and coloniality from the perspective of Eastern Europe. By bringing these topics and themes in the center of Europe, we also ask if colonialism possesses the nationality and whether it's uh, contained with territories and national borders. How can we come together to resist it? And through this program, we are also helping to discern how imperial colonial thinking survives throughout time on different territories and in a large variety of forms in culture, language, education, memory politics, economy, historical narratives, and so on. We invite you all to for reflection, reflection introspection, and action. And now I hand uh, over the word to um, Sasha. Thank you, Yulia, and thank you, Patricia and Lynn, for presenting the program. A few more words about uh, the title and the current lecture, the, the lecture that we're going to have today. So the, the program borrows its title from the book, uh, Soviet Postcolonial Studies, A View from the Western Borderlands. And its author, Ep Anus, who we have the chance to have today, is a literary scholar and writer. Ep, you are an pro uh, associate professor with Tallinn University in Estonia, and you regularly teach at the Department of Slavic and Eastern European Languages and Cultures in Ohio State University in the US. Your recent books include Soviet Postcolonial Studies, which uh, was already mentioned, and also Coloniality, Nationality, Modernity, a postcolonial view on Baltic countries under Soviet rule. Both were published by Rutledge in 2018. You are interested in Soviet and post-Soviet Baltic cultures, post-colonial studies, environmental studies, and phenomenology of everyday life. You are also a fiction writer, and you published several novels and books for children. Your last academic book, Soviet Post-Colonial Studies, has been an essential source and support for the activities of our group, as it also resonates with our approach to individual and collective stories, artistic practices, and fiction seen as legitimate and valuable sources of knowledge. In this work, you propose a view on the Soviet colonial project and occupation from the perspective of, of the Baltic countries, and notably Estonia, when you grew up. The expression colonialism in camouflage appears there as a reference to a disguised, many-faced colonial project inflicted by the Soviet Union inside and outside of its borders, unfolding in the frame of one continent and accompanied by anti-colonial and anti-capitalist rhetoric, it never explicitly acknowledged its own colonial nature. Therefore, a critical eye is required when it comes to disclosing these strategies. Thank you, uh, Sasha. And now we just uh, leave the floor to Ep. And uh, I would just um, remind you that people that are online, if they can switch off their camera during the talk, 
And also that at the end, we will have a um, Q&A that the audience online and offline can take part in. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. And thank you, Modern Museum and the collective Beyond the Post-Soviet for this invitation. I'm very honored to give this talk here today, and I very much regret that I cannot be there uh, in person. But hopefully we'll have an occasion to, to see and meet and talk in person some other time. And I start with a map of the uh, Soviet Union just to refresh all of our memories about, about first of all, the vastness of the Russian part of it. So I have to tell, remind you right away that actually within the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republics, there were many other nationalities that were living there and ethnicities, smaller ones. So it's not just like all hegemonic uh, uh, Russia there. And uh, you can see uh, on the northern, northwestern part, uh, uh, there is uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, quite small, and then we go down to Belarus, Ukraine, and the other Soviet uh, states that uh, uh, that are part of the Soviet Union. So I start surprise, surprise with Stalin. But uh, let me actually first go over some very basic uh, terms here so that we are all in the same uh, page. What's colonialism? How do we understand it? And let me just remind you, there's no one standard for colonialism. We very often encounter this uh, attitude like, well, according to this classical model, you know, this particular area doesn't fit in. We should understand colonialism as a phenomenon that has very many different forms. One of them is continental colonialism. And here I provide a definition by Dietmar Sherkovich. Again, it's possible to define what's colonialism, what's continental colonialism in many different ways. But here's Dietmar. Continental colonialism is a process and outcome of territorial expansion land-based economic underdevelopment and center periphery dependency of on a main land. And uh, he also proposes, and he looks comparatively, for example, on Russian empire, Chinese empire, and some others. And he proposes that in a nutshell, one can say that maritime empires are more driven by economic and continental empires by political interests. And I guess this is something we can think about. And then well, the same uh, statement that uh, we already heard in the introduction, but let me just repeat it over once more. Colonialism can well be in camouflage. So Soviet colonialism was a product of the era of late colonialism. And the, the Soviet regime never publicly articulated its strategies as explicitly colonial, because at that time it wasn't fashionable anymore. To, to be a colonial empire was not something that you could brag about, as it was the case in the 19th century. And so in the Soviet case, you really had to have a critical eye to see the colonialist features under the, what we can call communist camouflage, under this talk of friendship and of nations and all this. Well, let's now get to my uh, part one of my talk, I drink to the health of the most outstanding nation. And these are the words by Stalin. And you can guess what is the most outstanding nation here for Stalin? And yes, correct. This is, of course, the Russian nation. Uh, and uh, uh, Stalin proposed a victory toast uh, after the end of the uh, World War II, or as Russian would say, it Great Patriotic War. And Stalin uh, proposed a toast on May 24th, uh, 1945, at the victory banquet organized in honor of uh, Red Army commanders. And you see, this is how the major newspaper Pravda uh, um, talked about this uh, banquet the next uh, day. Uh, yeah, and they, they are these different commanders you see in the image here. 
And so and this was the final toast of the you know, long celebratory evening. And here's Stalin's toast. Comrades, permit me to propose one more last toast. I would like to propose a toast to the health of our Soviet people and in the first place, the Russian people. I drink in the first place to the health of the Russian people because of it is the most outstanding nation of all the nations which make up the Soviet Union. I propose a toast to the Russian people, not only because it is the leading people, but also because it's clear mind, stable character and patience. And uh, here is an example, this uh, uh, a speech or toast, uh, which was quite short, was, uh, uh, was then uh, reproduced in all different major newspapers all over the Soviet Union. So this is the Estonian version. You have a talk about first about some description about the reception and who participated, who said what, and then a special, special, uh, uh, you know, a shrift uh, is is given to uh, Stalin's toast. And uh, let's not move forward here. But uh, so let me just point out Stalin's speech, heroizing Russians as the great, as the greatest nation in the USSR, offers a superb starting point for investigating Soviet colonialism. As we, see, as we see, Stalin uses the occasion of the victory banquet to certify the position Shut of the up. Russian I'm nation. I'm he declares that he, he declares I'm that Russian people are essentially more worthy than other nations yeah, of the I Uh, hello, yes, so you can hear me. Let's try again then, indeed. So we were just looking uh, in the middle of the map, you see here these uh, territories that were annexed by the Soviet Union uh, during the World War II. You can see parts of Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and then parts of uh, uh, Poland now being uh, Bel uh, part of Belarus and then Ukraine. Uh, extending to the west and then Moldavia and SSSR added. And of course, the uh, Kaliningrad Oblast, uh, this weird uh, slice of uh, land under Lithuania. Uh, interesting, but now my screen, my, I cannot move my slides. Let me uh, start sl slide sharing again. Screen. Yeah, now let me try just to start the slideshow over again. I can't uh, share this particular slide. Yeah, that's weird. I can't. Uh, how do you see it? You you still see right now my slides on the left side running too, right? Yes, right. Yeah, it does not allow me to start the slideshow for some reason anymore. From beginning. Maybe if you try and click from beginning, maybe. Uh, you know where the button where it starts? Maybe go from count slide, maybe. Yes, I click it, but it does not do anything. Maybe restart office, maybe. That might work. Yeah, let's do this. So, sorry about this. It's... 
seems like the temporality of this talk <laughs> has been changed quite dramatically. Now I opened it again. All right, but it still doesn't, now this flight, oh, okay, now it started, great. So we left ourselves in, uh, finishing with uh, Stalin's toast, and I want to draw a parallel here between uh, Stalin's idea of the great Russian nation and uh, and uh, Rudyard Kipling's poem from the uh, 1899, which is an emblematic, emblematic uh, example of uh, colonial discourse, colonial enlightenment discourse. And let's read this one. Take up the white man's burden in patience to abide, to seek another's profit and work another's gain. Take up the white man's burden, the savage wars of peace, fill full the mouth of famine and beat the sickness keys. And uh, if we look at the, uh, uh, okay, let's, let me just add uh, uh, another example from the Stalin era. So what we see in uh, White Man's Burden uh, poem is this idea that the white man comes to help and is, uh, is some kind of a superior creature who comes to other countries and then uh, helps these other, other countries to, to become almost as good as he, but not quite. And you see another uh, similar rhetoric then around this great Russian nation discourse. Uh, another fact or another story that's being elaborated around uh, uh, Stalin's quote is this idea exactly that the Russians were so great because they helped all the other nations of the USSR to overcome their centuries long misery and their state of backwardness. In carrying, in, uh, in carrying out its Leninist, Stalinist, nationalities policies, and this is an article also from 1945, I uh, cite from here, the Russian nation extended its brotherly hand to the formerly backward nations of our land in order to realize their economic and cultural ascent. And then interestingly, uh, this uh, uh, this rhetoric of uh, basically what we can call colonial enlightenment discourse in the Soviet era in the 1930s was uh, uh, connected with the Russian empire uh, from the 19th century and from earlier times. And a good example here is uh, the famous Russian writer Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, his monument that was erected already in 1880s, and but in 1937 the original inscription is supplanted by the stanza from Pushkin's poem Exegi Monumentum, and this particular poem then is like openly imperialist, we could call it. So Pushkin imagines how his fame is, is appreciated all over the Russian empire. Rumor of my fame will sweep across Great Rus and my name will resound in every language that they speak. The proud grandson of the Slavs, the Finn, the still savage Tungus and the friend of the steppe, the Kalmuk. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, David Brandenberger, um, a historian has uh, commented and let me cite uh, David Brandenberger here, that such a paternalistic colonialist vision of the Romanov empire of an imperial expanse of Western Finns, Southern nomads and small peoples of the North united culturally by the Russian uh, people, that such a vision could come to be considered compatible with Soviet ideology speaks volumes about the Russia-centric tenor of the times. 
Nevertheless, these lines became an uh, official mantra of sorts during the last years of the Soviet, uh, of the 1930s decade in particular. So to move forward here then, uh, Actually, let's let's just stop here for a short while. Uh, so, what uh, what David Branderberger uh, points out is uh, is uh, also that this characterization of Russians as great nation uh, turned out to be sticky. And Branderberger's work looks at the uh, Russian popular culture in the 1930s and 1940s and sees how this idea takes hold. And uh, he follows, for example, journalistic materials. There are, for example, uh, transcripts of school classrooms, uh, uh, lesson plans, and all these places. You can see that, that this topic is, is developed in different ways. Uh, and uh, at the same time, what we also see is that uh, uh, this uh, ideology didn't only uh, uh, flourish during the Stalin era, which of course was the best time for it, but it also uh, was sustained later. And here's an example from ways later times. So this is uh, uh, material gathered in post-Soviet Latvia and Kevin Platt had made interviews here and um, he summarizes his interview findings, and I quote Kevin Platt here, a common explanation and legitimization of the Russian presence in the area revolves around the work of cultural and social construction that Russians are thought to have carried out in building Latvian society, industry, and such others. Discussions of Latvian educational policies which impose education in Latvian and Russian children are most often couched in terms of the relative inferiority of Latvian civilization by comparison with Russian civilization, which possesses universally recognized worldwide significance. So, and we see similar material, we find it also in other post-Soviet uh, uh, non-Russian uh, uh, states where Russian minorities still have this feeling, not of course all of them, and, and this particular material is, is uh, gathered 10 years ago, but still this lingering feeling, uh, and certainly more in the Russia proper, that, well, we are this great nation who have always been, you know, helping other nations, not colonizing them. And uh, uh, David Brandenberg also points out to, to the other side of this uh, idea of Russian nation. So it, uh, it's, it was the orientalization of non-Russian peoples, which Brandenberg uh, calls Stalinist Orientalism. So once Russian eth ethnicity was identified as historical people, uh, it suggested that the other non-Russian peoples lacked a similar pedigree. Not only were political and military innovators seen as uniformly Russian, but Russians came to exemplify progress in the cultural sphere as well, with non-Russians epitomizing only traditionalism. Non-Russians were collectively cast as if frozen in time, forever clad in furs and exotic pre-modern textile and surrounded with obsolete tools and field implements. Only Russian culture stretched forward in time into the Soviet period. And uh, yes, I think this map is such a wonderful uh, example of that. You see all the Soviet nations in their national costumes, which were born 100 years ago or more, uh, even more in a more distant future. So you get this. Uh, idea that this is how you characterize peoples. And what's interesting here, this map, this is from 1969, this comes from National Geographic. So actually also Western uh, um, uh, opposition to Soviet rule, they also took over these same cliches of, uh, of non-Russian nationalities. So, uh, just to conclude this part one of this talk, 
um, to point out the main points again, colonialism uses a civilizing discourse. And we have to understand that this effort to civilize another culture in another geographical area is a colonial effort, accompanied as it is by privileging of a civilizing colonial power and by the disregard for local interests. The colonial attitude entails unresponsible, uh, unresponsiveness or a derogatory attitude towards local cultures and local ethnicities. And it proceeds from a sense of cultural difference and cultural superiority supported by a colonial power structure. And uh, so I would now like to just uh, very briefly touch upon the uh, topic of education. How did education help to consolidate these colonial ideas? Uh, and then we move on to specific examples from, from, from the cultural sphere and also talk about how subaltern uh, finds a voice and can speak. So education and uh, just to start, uh, start out here, this is a kind of a common understanding in post-colonial studies. Uh, and here it comes from one of the major canonic textbooks, the post-colonial studies reader. Education was a massive canon in the artillery of empire. The military metaphor can, however, seem inappropriate since unlike outright territorial aggression, educational effects in Kramsch's terms, uh, education effects in Kramsch's terms, a domination by consent. This domination by consent is achieved through what is taught to the colonized, how it is taught and the, su the subsequent emplacement of the educated subject as a part of the continuing imperial apparatus. And uh, of course, uh, the same, this uh, idea of domination by consent was something that uh, Soviets understood very well. Uh, so first of all, you take over media, and then the second thing indeed is education. So, and here are some examples from Estonia. In higher education, after the Soviet annexation of 332 pre-war PhDs, only 16 could continue academic work. Well, some of them could be reha rehabilitated maybe 10, 15 years later. And those who were, worked in the Estonian Academy of Sciences, the academics, not a single one stayed in the pre-war position. And in the humanities, by the end of the 1950s, 95% of pre-war academic staff had lost their jobs. So we're talking here about huge, huge uh, re reorganizations, people losing their jobs. However, uh, uh, another side of this was also just talking about what do you need to what do you need to teach at schools? And of course, here you encounter the same. Uh, a great Russian nation discourse. And this is a, um, a fragment from a, the discussion about how to, how to study history of the USSR and how to teach it in school programs. And uh, the focus here is you need to talk and you need to teach children about the greatness of Russian culture. So how Russian culture is of special importance and how uh, uh, all the uh, fraternal Soviet republics need to cultivate love and respect towards the Russian nation. And thus, the slogan we have to learn from the Russians echoes back from all corners of the world was from the claim that was made in education. And this rhetoric was tuned down after the Stalin uh, um, era ended, but some remnants of that definitely remained, and they remained in popular consciousness, which was an important part of that. But interestingly enough, you cannot really, uh, you cannot really just hire all uh, teachers uh, and fire all teachers uh, in different levels of education, in elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, where do you get these new cadres? So that was a huge problem. And the result was that the, you couldn't really absolutely write over the past, the memory, and uh, 
knowledge uh, survived uh, this kind of knowledge that was you know typically shared in in the pre-soviet times uh, so so uh, schools school system nevertheless also continue to disseminate dissent many lost their jobs but many actually stayed and uh, and uh, and school uh, kids found ways to, to pre pre Soviet era materials. And this is the story of the post World War period. Things were different in these parts of the Soviet Union, which were annexed already after the revolution. Uh, so so it's, it's kind of a, a story of the Western borderlands of the Soviet Union. So let's go to the final section of our talk, Subaltern Who Speaks. And here, this image uh, comes from, uh, from the cover of my book. And I like this image very much. Why? Because uh, I think it just uh, uh, gives us a very nice sense of the complexity of the era. So there are these sculptures, Estonian sculptures, Fergie Sannames, Karibaldi Pommer and August Pom. What are they doing? They are modeling a sculpture of Lenin to be erected in front of the Estonian Academy of Agriculture in Tartu. So uh, this is a pre-given task. I mean, there were certain ways how you could, uh, how you could present Lenin you you know, for, for your creative energy. It doesn't exactly offer very much. But at the same time, all these people also come with their pasts. Uh, Ferdi Sarnames has been, had been living in Paris in the 1930s. He participated in the Paris 1933 Salon d'Atom exhibition. And so I think they do still carry a certain like ironic attitude or a, 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 a sense of estrangement towards this particular project. And these figures, it seems to me, display that quite clearly. How there's a certain mismatch between this Lenin and then uh, these figures around, around him, which just look like, especially the two in the left side, look like some kind of, uh, you know, European intellectuals. So as Coyote Spivak has argued in, in the colonial context, the subaltern cannot speak. Uh, according to Spiox, the subaltern position involves the inability to express opinion in a way that would carry its weight in society. In the distribution of collective space, the subaltern Spivak describes uh, is destined to the sphere of silent invisibility. I would say though that uh, this is always a question of negation. So uh, definitely in the Soviet era where you had already uh, in the Western borderlands, you had already re-established re intellectual traditions. Uh, there was this constant effort to negotiate what's possible to speak, what's possible to do. And then, of course, occasionally the results were, were uh, even perhaps uh, uh, sending to Kulak prisons or whatever, but people still tried. And let me show you a few examples now. This one is by Mara Wint from 1985. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so we see here a vision of the sea. There's a sea in the background and the seashore. And for Estonian culture, seashore had been very, very important as part of national identity. And now what you have in the Soviet era is, uh, is a militarization of the seashore. You had to have sp uh, special permits to enter certain areas. It was a question of what time were beaches open, those ones which were open, etc. So after the sunset, you couldn't go, etc. So this image is about the uh, it basically, it exemplifies this situation, but at the same time, you can say, look, this is just an image. I mean, uh, yeah, strange beach, so whatever. You can't really say, like, look, you cannot, you cannot uh, show such an image uh, because it's anti-Soviet. And here's another one. This is uh, George fights with a dragon. 
So this is a, a it's a story, famous story, right? Saint George fights the dragon. What's the, what's the question? Of course, you can you can you can uh, illustrate such uh, such myths, but of course, people were reading it as fight with the Soviet dragon. So you can see that the dragon, Soviet rule, has swallowed the fighter, but the fighter still continues fighting. And this is from 1979. And here's another one, uh, now from the uh, field of literary uh, creation. By, uh, this is by Jan Koplinski, a poem that was published in 1967. And we can see that this is a, you can, we can call it an anti-colonial critique in literature. So here's the poem then. We need to walk very quietly, eyes and ground. You don't need to ask, what are we looking for? A long time ago, our land uh, fell, our, our land became yours and our state fell down in shards into the big and empty world. Find what happiness you can, only don't ask us what we are hoping for. And of course, this poem, and this is the beginning of the poem, uh, this poem was widely read in reference to the annexation of independent Estonia by the Soviet Union. But later, this poem identifies the oi of the poem, those who need to walk very quietly, the oi as Native Americans. Yet the reader is left without a clear historical reference point until the 19th line of the poem. For Soviet era readers, this poem gestured towards Estonian subordinate political status, which it posed in unhappy contrast with their former independence. And it drew a clear line between you, the newcomers, and us, the local ethnicities. And let's look at another image uh, by a, a Lithuanian uh, artist. And this is again, it's a spoon. So, you cannot, you can say like what's political, what's, what's political about an image of a spoon. Uh, and, but if you look at the Lithuanian National Gallery of Art website, uh, we hear that Karalius, the author, wanted to point out the other repressive and thorny side of the public image of socialism. So you can just, uh, these images, these uh, uh, poems, etc., are open to interpretation. But if we uh, uh, skip uh, over some decades and look at the post-Soviet uh, era, and uh, let's uh, uh, look at, uh, and this is our final example here. This is an example from Eugenia Kononenko, a Ukrainian author. And uh, this is a, a novel that was published in 2012. And this is now a, is a good example how uh, there is an effort to find one's own voice and language after, um, after the era of colonialism or in the process of decolonization. So one of the common cultural trajectories stretching from the Tsarist era up to the Soviet and post-Soviet years was the imposition of Russian language, especially since the late 19th century. But in some cases, including Ukraine and Lithuania, significantly earlier. The short-lived flourishing of national cultures in the 1920s, during the era of the colonization from the Tsarist rule, was then followed by the brutal liquidation of national elites in the 1930s. And Subsequently, then we heard how this uh, colonial enlightenment uh, discourse of great na Russian nation developed in the 1930s. Uh, for, for Ukrainian post-colonial literature, uh, the downgrading of Ukrainian language and culture over the colonial periods is of central significance. And Vitaly Chernetsky, one of the leading Ukrainian scholars, writes that, and I quote uh, him now, in a classic case of colonialist cultural policy, Ukrainian culture was continuously stigmatized in the Russian and Soviet empires as a minor 
the Balton culture from a local provincial interest, as in, for example, Kazakhstan and as in colonial context all over the world, the language of the imperial center, in this case Russian, became the means to, take, to make a career and to advance in society. The Russian language came to signify high culture, modernity, urbanization, the Ukrainian culture and language, in contrast, came to be associated with backwardness and peasant life. Uh, so many, in many parts of the former Soviet Union, such processes of cultural othering and non-Russian languages and cultures became irreversible. For example, if you look at the smaller finno ugrian nations, which are still under Soviet, uh, or, sorry, not Soviet, but under Russian colonial rule within the territory of the Russian Federation. So there is no way to save these cultures, it seems, because it's so clear that Russian is the language of, of uh, education, the way to make a career and all that. However, with the collapse of the Soviet state, the, the decolonial reaction of significant impact unfolded across various parts of the Soviet, of the former empire. In Ukraine, a revaluation of the Ukrainian language took place. People switched deliberately and collectively to conversing in Ukrainian instead of in, U in Russian. And uh, uh, Yevgen uh, Eugenia Koninenko's novel describes this process in detail. And uh, I, have many, I have many Ukrainian friends and they have described exactly similar kind of process and the excitement that uh, accompanied it. So this is uh, now the description of the 1990s and actually also the end of the 1980s and early 1990s, how the, uh, uh, Ukrainian intellectuals and more and more the younger people who uh, started to develop, develop their intellectual interests, they spoke about everything in Ukrainian and at the time, uh, and here's the main character of the novel, he felt that in Russian, he would have been enabled to discover the new meanings which were coming to light. So Ukrainian uh, becomes the language of communication for these young people. Uh, and the main character in the novel, Yevhen, was born in the Soviet era, grew up speaking Russian at home, yet experiences a change of language and the transformation of being even at the end of the 1980s. So Ukrainian became a language of communication for him rather than the language of the classroom, of theatrical performances or of poetry. And that was great. In the Ukrainian world, he truly began to feel an unexpected inner harmony and a will to live, which he hadn't known before. The novel presents the shift from Russian to Ukrainian as setting the stage for a fuller sense of existence. This change is by no means merely linguistic. It also brings about change in Yevhen's the main character's social position, his creative self-expression, his relation to masculinity and his sense of self. As for the Ukrainian language in specific, it seemed to offer new possibilities lacking in Russian. Uh, so as we hear there in the last quote here, in the Ukrainian world, he, Yevhen, truly began to feel a kind of inner harmony and a will to live, which he had never experienced before. As we see, the colonial value hi hierarchy has overturned. Ukrainian now appears as a superior medium of self-expression, surpassing the possibilities of uh, the colonial tongue. Koninenko's novel focuses on Yevhen's process of finding his voice resolving the silence of the unsettling mismatch between words and beings. The novel does not, and I'm uh, wrapping up here, the novel does not present re ukrainization as an easy path for its protagonists. Instead, it conveys the oft witnessed logic of the decolonial situation. Often enough, initial excitement is followed by the sobering acknowledgement of complications and disappointments by ways of emigrations 
as well as by the new cultural achievements brought to life by subsequent generations. Most regrettably, as we have seen most recently in Ukraine, and now we have to turn from fiction to reality, the processes of decolonization can also be interrupted by a new wave of colonial warfare, new destructive deadly attacks on one's land, culture, and on one's right to dwell in peace in one's own language. And thank you. This is Ireland here. Thank you so much. I don't know if we can clap uh, on the Zoom, but I would love to, and I hope that the audiences will join me. And I think that now we jump into discussion. I think the first question should come from uh, Mudam audiences, from Mudam space. So Mudam, you need to unmute yourself. Patricia. Mm, we do not hear you still. Okay. Ah, thank you. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, today, technology is uh, just rebelling uh, and trying. Exactly. This is Sunday. I think it's uh, yeah, it's uh, more slow. Uh, but thank you, thank you very much, Ab, for this um, for this key lectures, which bring very important topic. And I, I just want to to jump in also on the first. Um, First thing that you said, uh, also to mention that I had the news during the talk that the Museum of Kherson, which is in the south of Ukraine, has been actually um, taken over by the Russian and that all the works, which includes a collection, a big collection of 17th and 18th century works, has been brought to uh, Crimea to a destination that is well uh, until now unknown. Um, so this is a very uh, fact that um, I would say open uh, our discussion and open on what's um, what's today. Um, I, I would just ask you, uh, Ab, about uh, these comparisons um, with with Ukraine and also on the on general idea of colonizations um, that we see often in the history of uh, Soviet dominations that we address the words uh, Sovietization. And in the reverse process, the desovietization or decommunizations. Uh, That's one of the law uh, from Ukraine has been one of the marker of this um, this this law these this last uh, years. But uh, in your writings, you name Soviet strategy as colonialism and Soviet colonialism. So why do you think is it important to use this term uh, colonialism uh, in relation to these territories? Yes, thank you for this question. And this is something I get plenty from historians because uh, historians uh, often enough, uh, they have their uh, you know, set of terms. And uh, if you do not work with post-colonial theory, you just uh, look at your particular research object and you think like, okay, you know, Soviet rule, thus it was a Soviet uh, 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 Sovietization, obviously now we need to de-Sovietize and uh, they use uh, this uh, uh, vocabulary. Well, I see, first of all, I would say there's a plenty of very good work done uh, with uh, through this word of Sovietization, I don't have to. I don't say that we need to just like completely discard all that work. If you look at particular sources and events, you still get your uh, uh, your facts right. Right. However, why do I think that uh, uh, colonialism is an important term to? bring in, there are many, many reasons for that. First of all, then it opens up uh, the whole field of comparisons. Exactly, uh, we can now see that the colonial discourse, colonial enlightenment discourse was quite widely used all over the, over the world. This basic idea that 
well, we come to enlighten you and you should be thankful. And of course, then locals are not being asked if they want to be enlightened. But this is such a very common uh, strategy. If we just call it Sovietization, we do not understand that this is something that's been going on for centuries already. And another part, if we just talk about Sovietization, we do absolutely uh, erase this, uh, um, you know, different hierarchies of nationalities within the Soviet Union. The, you know, the, you can't talk about this uh, discourse of a straight Russian nation just uh, by the uh, uh, notions of Sovietization, because in a way this even goes against the idea of Sovietization. So, so yeah, I think I think it's very important also to bring in colonial colonial uh, vocabulary explicitly address Soviet rule and of course a Russian rules uh, during the Tsarist Empire before that as a colonial uh, 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 rule and in this way we can see that different uh, ethnicities were treated differently and the whole meaning of the system was different for Russian speakers and for, for those who lived in non-Russian borderlands. But it's a very important question. Thank you very much, Ab. Thank you. Um, maybe uh, we can address um, also our group uh, beyond the post-Soviet. So many of us are here online, and uh, we're sure that you have some questions to Ab, and then we will also open it to the audiences in to the audience in Luxembourg. So you can raise your hand if you have. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um... Yes, it was really interesting. Thank you, Ab, for also for your reaction and uh, for this interesting lecture. Um, yes, my name is Faina Yunusova. I'm also part of um, Collective and I'm an artist from Uzbekistan and based in Germany. So um, when we talk about uh, colonization, I think it also was mentoring a kind of trap um, that the subaltern falls into uh, because if post-colonial so society today is oriented for, uh, towards uh, western principles it's placed to be frame of, of colonized subject and uh, as soon as it tries to return to its roots and use elements of maybe lost uh, local culture it's can be also blamed for self exotization And speaking of this trap, uh, maybe Ab, um, how do you see the work strategy of the re representatives of uh, this ethnic uh, groups? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Indeed, the whole question of uh, Decolonization is such a such a very very complex one, and uh, if you look all over the world, it's been different, uh, difficult process, and not very successful very often. So, uh, one of the one of the strategies that uh, that's often used, or uh, Kayatri Spivak has this term, strategic essentialism. So often enough, what we what we see in decolonial processes is indeed uh, using essentialized images of both of one's own culture and also the culture of the colonizers. And um, this is dangerous because you you just get into these very strict positions and all our culture, you know, it used to be glorious at one point back, and then they they are all evil. And um, in a way, this is different, difficult uh, uh, in this kind of a situation and in this mindset to find ways forward, because clearly uh, the world is changing, and uh, you cannot you cannot uh, uh, just be stuck in some kind of images of the past. Also. If you do, uh, there is a question, how do you deal with the colonial past so that you just, uh, um, you understand that the situation is also always hybrid 
So you shouldn't just like start, you know, killing all the, so to say, collaborators, but just understand how cultural mixes happen, how, 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 how to deal with the colonial era past. And that's very, 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 very difficult. And you see that there are no easy solutions. We see all over the post-Soviet uh, realm now, again, all this past has become, uh, you know, uh, a sign of danger because of Russian and uh, new aggressions. So this new fight of monuments, so that there are monuments, you know, all seems often easy that let's just destroy everything. Let's just destroy everything that reminds us of that uh, colonial past. However, you know, can we just destroy everything? <laughs> I mean, it's uh, the uh, buildings, uh, huge parts of cities being built. You cannot, you cannot. You just have to address it, try to uh, come to terms with it, try to perhaps uh, change its meaning, articulate it, understand it. But the danger is the danger of essentialism is very clearly there, and uh, there's no easy way to. It's just uh, politics often uh, uh, works through essentializing, unfortunately. So, which is something we should try to avoid. But so I think what we need then is just lots of different voices that also go against these essentializing trends. And artists have uh, such a huge role there right, to point out the ideas, point out the differences and make sure that all these different voices in each era uh, will get representation. Thank you. Thank you, Eb. Thank you, Faina. Uh, I think that we have next question online from Katerina Batanova. Yes, hello everyone, yeah, works. Um, thank you Ep, very much for your very um, enlightening lecture. I think it's extremely important to um, talk from different positions about the Soviet and Russian coloni colonialism today. Um, what I want to say is rather probably a comment, maybe not so much a question, but let's see, maybe it can turn into a question. And I ask it from position of, um, I am a Ukrainian, a curator and writer and cultural critic who is based in Switzerland uh, since some years, but um, especially since the beginning of this war, I uh, was and I am writing extensively um, on decolonization and about the uh, Russian um, colonial discourses. So my comment to your lecture um, or my bit issue with your lecture is um, the way you talk about the enlightenment of um, other people, because you talk about the Russian enlightenment as if it's a goal. And maybe the issue is because you start the lecture um, with the Stalin and the Stalin era, because of course your focus is you know, Estonian Baltic states, uh, but the colonialism did not start with Stalin, right? It's not Soviet colonialism, it's Russian colonialism and it started with the Russian empire, or actually, you know, if we really go back to history, then probably we can stretch it and see that it started with the Moscovia being colonized by Mongols, and then this movement reversing back. Uh, and for me, the problem with not having, I mean, you mentioned it in passing, but basically not having this uh, continuity of Russian colonialism, you know, from the Russian empire to the Soviet empire, uh, is uh, missing the part that um, the inferiority of other peoples in, in Russian Empire and in Soviet Empire uh, was uh, a part of the overall resourcification of you know natural resources and, and people because the the search for resources was the reason for colonization in Siberia and uh, you know the East and Central Asia and also the attitude towards the European parts of uh, Russian Empire and then Soviet Empire as Ukraine, for example. And this moment of you know, resourcification, I mean, the economic background, which makes then this enlightenment of other peoples a tool, but not the goal. And what it means also for the situation today, when you look at what is happening with the war in Ukraine and uh, you see who is mostly dying there on the Russian side, and those are like non 
Russian ethnic ethnicities, which is a part of Russification of a people. Um, so then it means the story of, uh, you know, subaltern a bit different and also the relation between different peoples and again, uh, Russian and Soviet empire a bit different. So maybe if you have tried to turn a comment to a question, I mean, how do you, how do you see that and how do you address this uh, legacy, you know, back to 1918, 17th century? Yes, thank you, Katerina. I think this is. So, I'm very glad that you that you brought out this larger context, and uh, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I I took a Stalin's theme here today because I think there's just and the discourse, the question of enlightenment discourse, because I just see so many similarities with what's happening right now. Uh, Putin's uh, uh, how Putin frames his aggression, his warfare. I mean, he needs to uh, develop this positive discourse for his own nation. So that's why I was focusing on this particular aspect of the of Soviet colonialism today. But actually, two weeks ago, I talked uh, in Princeton about uh, uh, economic colonialism during the Soviet era. And this is yeah, obviously, yes, yes, very uh, a huge topic and very, very relevant. And you are certainly right that uh, the roots of Soviet colonialism, they go back to the Tsarist era, to Russian Empire, and uh, I did suggest a little bit in this direction, uh, in this uh, presentation, but it wasn't my 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 main focus here. And uh, and yes, I also agree that uh, if you want to, you know, have a, like an absolute view of how colonialism works, you need to uh, take into account many different ways. First of all, military part of it, just the fact that they come with. Uh, weapons, they, the army takes over, so there's battles, there's warfare, and this is a huge part, right? And then there's a question of, uh, of, uh, of course, economy, exploitation of resources. Uh, then there's a question of strategic importance, for example, the extension of the uh, Soviet Union and early uh, during the Peter the first times that the Russian Empire towards west towards the Baltic Sea it was considered as not so much a question of resources but it was strategically uh, important and right now Kaliningrad Oblast for example is a very good example of that it's just strategically it's so uh, Good for, for for Russian Federation to have its uh, its military in there in Kaliningrad. So it would be difficult for them to to make them to kill that one up. So yes, so you should you should look all of these things in uh, in unison, and at the same time you should always also keep in mind the pre uh, pre tsarist pre Soviet tradition, local traditions, how and how they differed in different parts of the Soviet Union. So the, the picture altogether is very, very complex. So I'm glad, Katerina, that you brought out some of these nuances, yes. Anything else I should, uh, and of course the resourcification is a good word to use. And I think it's, uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with this. And, and uh, so my answer is yes, <laughs> thank you. Any question here at Mudam? There is one question. Uh, thank you very much for your um, lecture. Um, I would like um, to recall uh, um, uh, the thesis of um, Pyotr Petrovsky, um, Polish art scholar who also contributed to um, post-colonial studies in um, Eastern European art, and he brought up the question of close art and uh, how it affects uh, post-colonial East European context. Uh, for example, uh, uh, if we take, I'm speaking from uh, Ukrainian context, I'm Ukrainian refugee at present, uh, and well, for Ukrainian context, for, for example, for Kyiv, uh, uh, photography school, uh, uh, post uh, 
uh, World War II, like I'm, I'm talking more about uh, like 70s, 80s, uh, uh, Lithuanian photography was more important uh, than Russian photography. It was like uh, not uh, to be compared. Uh, how um, peripheries, uh, uh, Western <laughs> peripheries of uh, Soviet Union were like of much more inf influence and uh, they even influenced uh, um, uh, socialist realism in such a way that uh, the same uh, like artists uh, like if we like uh, jump uh, to a monumental art uh, uh, they would uh, had to work in a post-Soviet state commission system uh, so if you can comment on this thank you yes thank you I mean this is such a yeah again such a big uh, uh, a big topic the question of uh, how these different colonial others uh, interacted what did how did they uh, impact each other I'm, I'm, I'm i was curious to hear about this lithuanian ukrainian connection i had i had no idea that, but of course uh, uh, lithuanian photography of that era we, we know some of the images and i used some of that in my book some of these images it was it was clearly uh, clear leading the way yes and then for many another part of that question would be also the uh, east central european uh, socialist states how poland became such an incredible source for for i think many non-russian nations but also to, to russian uh, cultural life uh, where just um, all the new trends happened perhaps a little bit earlier so, but at the same time, there's also the other side of that particular uh, particular issue is also the orientalization processes that were going on. For example, how the uh, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, I'm not sure about Ukrainians and Belarusians, but might have been the same, how they looked at the Central Asian populations. And there was clearly this orientalization that was going on. Uh, and you might even say that there was this almost like a colonizer, uh, the gaze of the colonizer uh, working. But of course, since they, this was not a position of power, it wasn't quite. So, so yes, I think it's an, um, uh, in, in some ways, it was a, a, a possibility that should have been used ways more also people uh, one of the um, uh, uh, statement that was made in the perestroika era in the 1980s was that there wasn't really a very good uh, knowledge of other uh, other uh, soviet cultures uh, surely certain uh, artists were in connection if you were in the same field but at the same time what you had in the soviet press was some kind of a, like a, uh, beautified image or this kind of an ossified image of other other uh, uh, borderlands or other Soviet nationalities. So, so uh, for example, one uh, Estonian cultural critic just said in 1988, like, we would love to hear about these other nations, but we don't know because we only have these this parade images and, and we should know more. So I think this is a this is something we should explore more. That uh, and they still this is still an open field of possibilities in the post-Soviet era, right? To to uh, to tighten these connections and to find support. And in a way, you see it, right? Who who support Ukraine the most right now are Polish, Lat Lithuanians, Estonians, Latvians try to try to make their voice audible within European Union, and uh, yeah, because of that feeling of we know how, what that means because we have had similar past experience. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very complete uh, answer to the question. Maybe we come back to the online audience uh, because we have two questions, two hands were raised, and maybe the first one would be Katerina Demerza. Would you like to ask a question, please? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for an awesome lecture. Uh, my question is about your experience in uh, trying to proceed with this post-colonial approach in Western academia. 
uh, how do you describe uh, like how what your experience was when you uh, talking about post-colonial approach to Soviet or to Russian Empire and then they say no no way it's not uh, a colonial discourse uh, it's uh, brother nations and uh, blah 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 please uh, if you can tell more Yes, yes, I think we have all encountered this kind of attitudes. I mean, you just have to continuously, you know, talk about details, point to very specific texts and look at the Stalin's toast, look at all the things that followed from here. And, uh, and uh, I think cultural scholars, cultural uh, criticism is always more open and then actually political science is also more open but the history there's a certain trend of uh, historical writing that is very hard to get uh, historians on board first of all because they do not like these big uh, comparisons they want to focus and say like look this is there's always a difference so yes it's just uh, this is an ongoing thing and uh, I, I just, yeah, I've been presenting plenty this this autumn and it's been interesting. Lots of conversations with um, American scholars. Oh, I also see there's a gender difference that female scholars are more open to, towards post-colonial approaches. I don't know if this is just an accident, but it seems to me when I have a positive feedback that often enough comes from, from female scholars and I get more attacks from, from male scholars. So I don't know what to think of that. But And another thing is interestingly, like if you talk about uh, these issues in the in the, uh, let's say there's a uh, conference or a symposium, people are talking in a public space, you get one response, it might be more hostile, but when you start speaking face to face with people, then they actually like, yeah, I agree, yeah, I agree. So perhaps there's a, we are in the era of transition here, and oh, definitely the uh, uh, Russian new warfare in Ukraine changed the attitude. I think it's very hard right now to say that the, uh, Russia is not does not have imperial uh, ambitions. Some use the word imperial and are more hesitant to use the word colonial. Uh, I think these two go hand in hand. So, but I think, and I hope that we are seeing a change here, but, you know, we just need a lot of patience and it's just amazing how many times I have made the same arguments over, over again, even for the same person, we start, we meet again and we exactly start all over again. It's just quite remarkable, but, but we need to do this work because this is an important topic. So I'm glad that you are all interested and uh, involved in this this kind of uh, thinking and uh, work yes thank you very much Ed, and thanks also to Katerina because I think you voiced the concerns that we all confront uh, every day so thank you uh, we had a question from Christine if you would like to address it please Hi, yes, actually it was the same question, <laughs> so it was already answered, but yes, I'm also um, just wondering sometimes and getting frustrated because I often have the impression that these topics kind of stay in an Eastern European context and a community of people that uh, emigrated from Eastern European countries, Central Asia, or still live there and um, sometimes I have the impression it's not yet really uh, a discourse in the Western academia and yes, it has to be promoted still and we have a lot of work to do. Yes, I would also add, uh, maybe there's also a generational difference that I so often I have a PhD students coming to me and saying like, oh, your work is so important to me or oh, I so much enjoyed your work. Whereas those uh, scholars who are on the verge of retirement or already retired, among them, there's definitely more resistance because they have had their whole career thinking differently. So it's very hard for them. Uh, even, you know, you can't believe it, but I have had over the recent weeks, 
over and over again, there is a conversation like, was, was race an issue in the Soviet Union? And the, you have many very esteemed scholars of older generations who say like, look, there was race was not a problem at all in the Soviet Union. It seems like so absurd for everyone who knows, who works with, uh, you know, issues in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, but of course all the Ukrainians who can tell you a lot about it. But I'm so glad you are all, you know, helping, helping, helping this process of, of changing the world. <laughs> Thank you. We have still some questions from the audience uh, at Mudam or remarks. Yes. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the fantastic talk. Um, really brought up some great ideas. I especially appreciated that expansion of the uh, idea of colonialism moving uh, beyond the, the typical understanding that we have here in Europe. Western Europe of um, it being uh, lands far away, not lands next door, right? Uh, so I really appreciated that. Now, um, I really also liked uh, your use of the idea of the subaltern. And I feel like the comment from the lady earlier that's living in, I believe, Switzerland, is that right? Yeah, um, was really, really great because um, that resourcification is really important to colonialism and not just uh, minerals and, and things like that, but human resource. Um, and so being able to orientalize or to other the people and to hierarchize or to create a hierarchy out of those other groups is so important um, for the colonizing project. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a bit on that more, uh, especially in the Russian case of using uh, some of those uh, other nations. And as we sell today, uh, they're using uh, in the war right now, um, non-Russian or, Ru sorry, I, I don't know. I don't know the correct language for this, but non-Russo, uh, or ethnic ethnicities from, for example, Eastern Russia and things like that, Siberia, uh, to fight in this war. Yeah. Yes, and this is so troubling, isn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, indeed, uh, well, one of the things we definitely what we see, for example, Uzbekistan comes to mind and uh, and the question of cotton, cotton production during the Soviet era, one of the things they did was creating these monocultures, right, where, where you had a quite, a, you know, diverse agriculture earlier, uh, the Soviets needed money, so cotton, you can, you can uh, uh, sell it uh, abroad, get uh, uh, hard currency, and this was incredibly destructive, right? And how, the, how, how incredibly destructive collectivization was uh, for Kazakhs, for Ukrainians, for all over, for Russians themselves also, but the, the Kazakh famine, uh, you know, is something we, we should talk way more. And of course, Ukrainian Holodomor, which is, uh, I think we are more conscious of that. And so this is, uh, during the Soviet era, there was this uh, weird combination, sure, resourcification and humans also as a resource. At the same time, the way how they wasted human resources, to say, right? How they let millions die, uh, because the nationality questions were definitely more important. So what happened then in the 1930s, it seemed like uh, uh, that uh, national uh, ideologies, national cultures were on the rise uh, in the 1920s. And then Stalin noticed and became afraid, especially in terms of Ukraine, because Soviet Union without Ukraine would have been uh, unimaginable. So there was this uh, um, sense of what if these nat uh, national uh, cultures uh, become too independent, uh, create themselves and want to separate. So 
definitely the number one thing was just suppression, uh, violent, uh, violent, careless uh, relationship to, to what you could call human resources, a positive thing. So yeah, this double dialectics here. Um, it's it's very complex, indeed, indeed, and destructive in very many different levels. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Eb, and uh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for the question as well and for the comment. And I think we have a question from Viola. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, everyone. I am. Uh, my name is Viola Wiazdowska, and I am also a member of the Beyond the Post Soviet. Uh, I am a visual artist, uh, and uh, I also am doing a PhD in the Art Academy in Gdańsk. Uh, my question is kind of a comment and uh, and and also a question. Um, I'm and following up the 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 like the kind of the comment of Katarina and the, um, the right now the question from the audience because I um, I think about this otherness of the nation that they have been um, colonized by the Russian Empire and then uh, afterwards about the post Soviet uh, Soviet uh, Union. And it came to my mind immediately uh, um, an illustration of Estonian man that I think I found out that was like um, uh, Ek Karabanov was uh, was done it like he did the uh, illustration of Estonian and Latvian people, and uh, he portrayed them a little bit like more animalistic, de like dehumanizing it. And my question is of this like like growing uh, otherness uh, of, uh, for example, also there was uh, a description of Belarusian that the young Belarusians are whipping at like Yelps, like or, like, or stuff like this. So I'm curious is, is because this miniature is coming from, um, I found it right now, 1851. How is it like, is there any examples, for example, in literature, um, or um, or other like visual representation that have been circulating during the Soviet uh, times, especially in, of course, in Russia, being productive by Russian propaganda or Russians, that they were actually were going further because we're talking about humans, uh, human as also resources, going further to actually also dehumanize um, dehumanize the nations. When you maybe something comes to your uh, to, to your a mind that was happening that in the uh, in different ways of uh, of expression yes indeed i mean one of the, one uh, thing that comes to my mind first was this uh, uh, affiliation uh, of the baltics uh, estonians latins lithuanians with uh, with uh, fascism and now we see the same discourse in relation to ukraine right Ukrainians are, or the fascist in power, that was uh, Putin's first claim. So thus we need to come and liberate and uh, and uh, make sure that, you know, Ukrainians are not suffering on this fascism. And uh, in the Soviet Union, this was a, a, a huge discourse. And again, it was part of the popular imagination that uh, uh, and Estonian, Latins, Lithuanians, they were fascists. So a part of that was because uh, um, they used different language. They used uh, Latin alphabet instead of Cyrillic. So everything uh, Latin, there was this uh, stereotype written in Latin alphabet. So this must be German because if people do not, uh, do not uh, if Russians wouldn't understand it, this was a way for them to say like, we don't need to understand it. So that was one, and but if we are looking at earlier periods, then uh, there's also a question of early uh, uh, layers of colonialism in, uh, uh, yeah, I opened right now the link, but I guess, uh, yes. And here, um, these early uh, uh, layers of colonialism and the whole ethnographic, uh, trend in the 19th century is super, super interesting. Uh, one part of that was that actually these ethnographers, leading ethnographers in, in uh, the Tsarist Empire were Baltic Germans. So people like Karl Ernst von Baer, for example, 
who, who were connected to the Tartu University. Uh, so you, then that already changes the whole, uh, the whole you know, realm of, of this circulation of uh, colonial ideas or orientalization of different nations. But they were uh, trans-European, they were not necessarily Russian-based, and the 19th century uh, Russian Empire relied heavily on, on German, uh, German uh, uh, intellectuals. There was even the, yeah, in, in different schools, they had professors both from Germany and then Baltic Germans from, from the uh, Baltic uh, uh, parts of the of the Russian Empire. So things become so complicated then, right? So you don't you don't even have like a clear. Oh, these are the bad guys, right? Who did it all? Because this is just uh, this is the discourse that is uh, is spreading from the Enlightenment era onwards, at least, and of course had different forms before that. And you have then this scientific discourses around races, and this is where also fascism developed from, right? So, so many different varieties. Uh, and uh, indeed, in the 19th century, you did have these images of, uh, uh, like, uh, for example, Estonians, the peasants, and Latvian peasants as, as very, like, significantly racialized as, a, as of a, you know, some kind of a lower class. And at that point, the dominant understanding was, let's say, mid 19th century, is that. Estonians or Latvians, these their only um, future for these uh, nations would be to assimilate to German. That there would be no way to, because of the you know lower quality, there would be no way to to have a, a fully functioning high culture and the scientific language and all that. So all these mixes and then of course if you talk about Lithuania there's a question of Lithuanian Polish relationship which definitely has a, a colonial aspect to it then you have Ottoman rule so you have such a mix of ideas and racial stereotypes that are coming in from different corners of Europe and they're mixing together starting from yeah, earlier centuries, not 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 at all just a, a Soviet thing. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. I think we have slowly to close, but I will just hand uh, the the floor to Azad Beck, who had the last question. So please. Thank you. So my name is uh, Azad Beck. I'm an artist and curator based uh, from Uzbekistan, based in Switzerland. And I was thinking about the, because as I'm really interested in decolonial studies, I know that colonialism has uh, had a huge impact on the way that European people see themselves, how the colonialism also um, constructed the national identity of a lot of countries in Europe. So I was thinking about how the Russian colonialism and the Soviet colonialism has also an impact on the way that Russians see themselves in the Russian Empire and in the Soviet Union, like how colonialism also helped to like build the national identity of uh, Russia. Yes, yes. And that is, I think that is such a crucial question these days, right? Because what we see is that once you develop an imperial identity, as you know, we are the great nation, and uh, oh, uh, and this is what happened in the definitely in the Soviet era. Not so much in you know, if we are talking about the Russian Empire, uh, there was no clear Russian identity yet developed, uh, like uniform Russian identity. There were different efforts, different ideas how to how to understand uh, the nation and its role, and. Uh, so David Brandenberger makes this claim, and I think quite convincingly, that the understanding of Russianness developed during the Tsarist era. Because first, after the revolution, during the Lenin's era, there was an emphasis on decolonization from the, uh, from the Russian Tsarist empire. And uh, um, everything Russian, uh, Russian related was not emphasized so much. And then during the Tsar, uh, uh, Stalin era, there was this occasion to think who we are and glorify the past. And what happened was that for in Russian imagination, 
uh, Russian and Soviet became homo synonyms. Yeah, so so Russia Russia equals Soviet Union, and we can see how other parts of the world took it over. If you if I talk to my American students even now, I mean their first impulse is Soviet Union. These were Russians, right? Uh, now with Ukraine I, uh, the, and the warfare, I hope that this is changing. But, but uh, yes, this understanding that Soviet Union is all our big homeland was something that was a lot promoted during the Soviet era. But these were Russians who bought it. Otherwise, other non-Russian nationalities never, I mean, they just thought this is, obviously it was just clearly a fake idea for them. No, they had their own more uh, specific homelands. And so once you have this idea of a nation also very much supported by the sufferings of the World War II. So look how much we Russians suffered. We were the ones who uh, won this war. This came very clearly, you know, you could see that in, in Stalin's speech and the whole ideas that developed from there. So we Russians, we won this great war. We sacrificed so much for the happiness of, of everyone, basically. So we are this great nation. And so what do you do then when the empire starts crumbling? And when uh, when economy uh, collapses, there is, uh, you know, just uh, poverty for many people. It takes time to build up a new economy. So you really have this crisis in identity. And this is what Putin used, right, uh, to, to force uh, to continue saying, like, look, we are these nations who need to uh, and the idea of great Russia that Putin is is developing. So I think it's uh, uh, but it's 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 very regrettable uh, side side uh, you know consequence of of this longer uh, historical developments that you get identities which and it's difficult to to change you know cultural imaginaries cultural big ideas. It takes a lot of time. So and it's as we see it's not going in the right direction right now for for russian national identity unfortunately hopefully something better is will be happening in the future but right now we don't really see even in a, any hope in that thank you Azakbek. that was a great question I think just to close our um, great discussions, I would just ask a last questions uh, because you are a writer and you write a fictional novel. Um, can you maybe choose a word that would describe uh, our ability uh, as a maybe post-colonial thinkers to imagine other futures and what words we can kind of for tonight have in mind and uh, that can bring us some meaningful reflections for tomorrow? Yes, thank you. Actually, it's nice that you brought this up uh, in the end here, because as a writer, my no uh, last novel is, uh, is a utopia, actually. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And uh, my idea behind it was that we actually, we need also some positive ideas. We just cannot, we die as human beings if we only dwell in the misery of what's all around us. So I was envisioning something like a realistic utopia, which is still at that point, maybe not in 10 years if we don't do anything, but right now there are still possibilities for it to open. And uh, the word that I, uh, let me choose the word, the sea, the sea, because I think it's a very, uh, first of all, for me personally, it's been very, very important because I grew up by the sea and then uh, the, the colonial era, uh, in, in Estonia closed the sea, the sea shore became bordered, there's a whole question when and how you can go there, it became politicized, uh, because who knows, maybe you escape uh, the Soviet Union, right, over the sea, and at the same time the fluidity of it, and it's amazing how the sea is always different, there's just such a, if you want to think about difference, and at the same time, something like permanence, the sea is your perfect example. Whenever you go there, you're always like, wow, I don't know. I mean, there's something new. And yes, yeah, so I think I like to think about the sea.
Thank you very much. And um, so we're closing this and I must apologize again for the technical issue uh, that appeared. Um, yeah, I hope it was, yeah, we, we had a, like a nice discussion. So very grateful. Thank you everyone for being here in Luxembourg, but also online. Thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Eb. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a nice Sunday. Thank you.